So we raised a pretty sizable seed round. We raised seven million dollars. And I remember when I raised all of that money, I just cried because I was like, oh my God, I've done all of this to get to the starting line. Like the game starts now. Welcome to the Lubo Smith Podcast. I'm your host, Lubo, co-founder and CEO of STRV. Here to talk to the industry leaders from the tech and startup space and ask them about their tips and tricks they use to operate at the top of the game. Today, I'm happy to welcome Varun Puri, co-founder of Udly, an AI-powered judgment-free speech coach that could be described as Grammarly for public speaking. Two out of three people are afraid of public speaking, and that's why Varun is so passionate about his mission, to help us all improve our public speaking skills and become better communicators. So let's dive right into the discussion. <laughs> Varun. I wanted to ask you right away, uh, what do you think about the current state of things in the world of AI? I'm so excited. It feels like a Netflix drama that I'm a small pawn in and it's a seven dimensional chess game. I'm watching it <laughs> from the side, slightly terrified if Microsoft or OpenAI with one you know, flick of a mosquito might swallow tens of thousands of startups, but it's very exciting. If there's ever a time to be in AI, it's right now. It's like, uh, you know, some people describe it as Game of Thrones, others like the Kardashians for geeks. Uh, it's crazy what's happening, but, uh, you know, I feel like there should be a documentary in the retrospective or even a book because that's, uh, that's insane what's happening out there. Also to all of our listeners, we are talking the the day after the whole Saul, Sam Altman OpenAI saga happened. So we're waiting to see if he's going to get reinstated at OpenAI or he'll go to Microsoft. Lubo, no question. There are going to be many books and many movies on this. I mean, if you combine all of the Twitter stuff, that's already 10 books. Uh, yeah, I, I have no doubts. And in the end, these are the books and uh, docu-series that I really crave for, like... Uh, the the one about Uber, I think it's called Super Pumped, uh, or the one about WeWork. Uh, just seeing what has happened there, and I know it's not always based on truth, hundred percent, but uh, it's it's crazy what's happening out there. And you are very close to it as uh, someone who is building in AI. I'm, as I would say, I'm a little chess piece somewhere in the vicinity of the chessboard but I'm definitely not in the room. I don't know what exactly is happening, but yes, we use ChatGPT and we are close to the Microsoft ecosystem. So in that way, we're affected. Well, uh, maybe we take a little bit of a step back and uh, talk about your journey uh, before you actually start uh, started pursuing uh, building your own startup. But uh, you uh, are not uh, a native English speaker, uh, same as uh, myself, and you also uh, had to move to, to the U.S., and I commute between U.S. and Prague all the time. So I wanted to go back to your early days and uh, see how you basically even ended up with the world of technology. What was the path there? Yeah, it's a good question. I'm not technical. I'm not an engineer, and I have a degree in economics but I spent college having way too much fun. The degree is the bare bones I did to get through. My very quick story is I'm Varun. I grew up in India, in Delhi, came to the US for undergrad. For me, that was an incredible opportunity. I mean, um, you know, the resources available to students in this country are in some ways unfair. A lot of people in India don't get access to this. I'm very grateful for that. Did my undergrad at a very small liberal arts college in Southern California called Claremont McKenna. And the way I found my way into tech is they had these college case competitions. I did one, landed up at Intuit as a result of it, did a sophomore year internship at Intuit. Then that's when I got hooked. I was like, oh my God, there are these 19 year olds wearing shorts, talking about synergy and innovation and Silicon Valley. And this is just a dream. Uh, from there, I got hooked. I spent my junior year summer at Google and then started my career at Google right out of college. So is that like the uh, natural path uh, that you you get there through the internships, uh, internships and uh, 
you don't have to go through like a very rigorous hiring process or did you still have to go through that? I wouldn't say it wasn't vigorous. I mean, in my Google interview, I still remember these Google interviews, you have no idea what you're going to get. My interviewer asked me, hey, Varun, here's a marker. Now go draw your whiteboard, your personality on the whiteboard. I was like, oh my God. And he asked, I draw something and he's like, great, now draw your personality 10 years from now on the whiteboard. And I was like, are you kidding me? This is for an internship. Anyhow, so, but the conversion from an internship to a full-time role is much easier than applying full-time right out the gates. So how did you describe your personality back then? And how would you describe it today? What has changed? Oh God, luckily I'm under less pressure right now because a Google job's not on the way. <laughs> I'll tell you what I drew back It's then. not an interview right now. I know, I froze. So I took the marker and I just made a bunch of scribbles, right? And basically there were overlapping lines and circles and whatnot. So I was like, this is my personality. I'm a liberal arts major. I'm a chess nerd. I'm really passionate about travel. I enjoy tech. There are all of these little things that are, you know, overlapping with each other. Some are Venn diagrams, some are separate, basically creating a mess and trying to figure out how to describe it to the interviewer. And then when he asked me 10 years from now, I was like, oh, wow, how do I fix this situation? So I took the <laughs> same thing and I drew the same scribbles, but with much bigger circles and, you know, much bigger light. And I was like, well, this is me 10 years from now. I think I'll always have eclectic interests and some of them will overlap. Some might be different from each other. I may not love chess as much and I might find a new passion, but I think the core of who I am, my values, my culture, my curiosity will likely still be the same. Do you think that you nailed it? Did it come to fruition? Did I nail it in, did I get the job? Yes. Did I nail it in, <laughs> is it true looking back? I think so. Uh, you know, I'm still very much the same person with a few more interests, many more battle scars, as confused about what I want to be when I grow up. Yeah, kind of makes sense. And like, it seems like you have had a blast uh, while working at Google. What were some of the projects that you were able to get your hands on? Yeah, Google is super cool. Have you seen the show Silicon Valley? Of course. Okay, then you'll appreciate this. So... Very early on at Google, I was tapped by Sergey Brin, who's one of the founders of Google. And Sergey said, you know, Varun, I'm looking for my Jared from the show Silicon Valley. And for those of y'all who haven't seen the show, Jared is just this jack of all trades, kind of the guy I mentioned in that Ben Diagram X, right? He would go and make coffee, but also write boardroom slides, also do customer support, also do sales, be like this human Swiss army knife. And my response to Sergey, who's uh, an incredible person and obviously very well known in the valley was Sergey, take a bet on me. I'm young, naive, and indestructible. I'm right out of college. I would be honored to work with you. So my first role out of college was to be Sergey's Jared. I did that for two years. All kinds of stories, incredible learning experience where I got exposure to some of the world's leaders who I admire, got to see how Google and its mother company Alphabet works on a six dimensional level, but also got to go into the weeds. And then that's what took me to Google X. So a lot of the Google execs worked out of Google X. Uh, so I was based there and it was incredible. At Google X, they're working on these moonshot projects, self-driving cars, balloon powered internet, robots, drones. There were days that drones would deliver your lunch, your burritos to you. Um, and I was like, I would love to work at X and then you know, through the Sergey role, I ended up transitioning to a job over at Google X. That's a very it long. It feels time. like it feels like a real life playground for a tech geek uh, to be at. Oh, without a doubt. The only difference is the people at Google X have seventeen PhDs and have exited twenty companies. <laughs> and then you know, if you're a scientist and you've done all of the academia stuff and you've done a few companies, you're like, let me come to X to work on projects that could ten x, not ten percent. Um, completely radically changed the course of humanity, right? Self-driving cars being an example. And, you know, one out of a hundred bets works, but the one that works can completely change the world. X is an incredible place to be. How how do you get to be Jared for Sergey Brin? Like, it seems like it was a very happy path uh, for yourself just doing the internship, internships and uh, getting there right away. Uh, I assume... It has not been that smooth. I mean, there are two questions. One, what's not been smooth? And the second is, how do you end up doing the Jared role? I don't know, to be honest. So when I joined Google full-time, I joined in their early grad rotational program. 
It's called the APMM program. Any marketer goes through it. It's a two-year fun gig where you switch through a bunch of roles. I know Sulgi was looking for someone and I got tapped. I still don't have a good answer for you. And it was an interesting role where I got a lot of exposure, but it was also really hard, right? Working with folks who I read about in the news or not exactly knowing what my job will be on a day-to-day -day basis because there's no ladder, there's no team. Um, it's very visible and I'm right out of college and I'm not even sure what I should be focusing on and I have zero skills whatsoever. So it was hard. But that's essentially how the rule happened. It was meant to be a one-month experiment and then the one-month experiment kept going on and on. How long did it last for? Ended up being two years. Yeah. And like, if you would uh, have to describe some of the things that you picked up from the collaboration with Sergey, what would it be? The honest answer is that everyone's a human. Everyone's going through the same stuff. I think when I was in that role, I would meet a lot of these people who I would just read about and be starstruck by. And then when I talk to them, I'd be like, oh, like you have a cold? Like, you know, how's your nose doing? Or you know, how's the food? Was it tasty? And I think just treating everyone as a human being um, really brings it back to first principles. The kinds of things I loved in that role is, you know, I saw all of these people who treated me, the little guy, really well and with a lot of respect. And I was like, that's awesome. If I ever get into a position where you know, I'm running a really big company, it all what really matters is how do I make the little guy feel? Am I a good person? You know, I'm sure there'll be ups and downs, but seeing the way character works at especially those higher levels at Google was really inspiring for me. And I assume that like, you know, seeing that even the people really high up go the same personal struggles and professional struggles that you go through uh, definitely makes you feel okay, more human. Everyone is more or less on the same level. I mean, totally. Look, uh, uh, fast forward to now, right? I'm a tiny startup founder. I'm trying to make this dream a reality. And I keep speaking to a lot of mentors, folks who I met through that job. And I keep telling them, oh, you know, I've got this problem and revenue didn't work. And this is what's happening with my team. And oh my God, a customer flicked. And they're like, oh, Varun, that's great. I'm dealing with the exact same problem. I just have a few more years of experience and the magnitude of my problem has a few more zeros behind it. But it's exactly the same. And I was like, oh, that's interesting perspective. Right, that's the perception because in the end, like you keep doing the same things. It's just that the scale might be different. Again, Lubo, what do I know? I'm still figuring this out. Uh, no, I think like, you don't, you don't want to be uh, underselling yourself. Uh, I think that uh, there is a whole lot of achievements that, you have done already. Thank you. Um, well, I would love to hear what was happening in your head. You know, it seems like a dream come true, uh, being born in India, landing a job after college at Google, working for Sergey Brin uh, directly, or having an opportunity to work on some of the most innovative projects out there what was going on in your head when you realized oh i want to pursue something on my own it's interesting when i was in the sergey role a lot of what i was doing was report building right i would tell sergey hey here's a brief of what happened last week or with a certain company and then he would take the decision for obvious reasons and one of my conversations with him was i would really love to be a builder myself so at that point there was a guy at Google X, Mahesh, who's one of my closest mentors, I admire him, who was coming up with an idea to bring internet to rural India using invisible lasers. The concept is in space, the way the International uh, Space Station talks to satellites is using light as a means for propagation. In fact, the way a lot of us get internet to our houses is light traveling through fiber cables. Now, the economics of digging fiber doesn't make sense in war-torn areas, in remote areas, etc. So Mahesh's idea was, what if we take these lasers from space and just use it to beam internet from one point to another? And I was like, that sounds amazing. If I can be based out of Google X, work on this incredible project, go home and see my family many times a year, it's just a dream. And if I'm on a date and I tell someone I'm shooting lasers for a living, they've got to think I'm cool, right? Like I'm 22 at this <laughs> point. 
the only thing I'm thinking about. Anyhow, so I joined Mahesh. Um, it was called Project Tara, and I grew with that project. It's now a full-fledged Google X project. And through that, I lived in sub-Saharan Africa for a while. I was in Rwanda, Uganda, Kenya, South Sudan, setting up these laser boxes. Obviously, spent a lot of time in India. And I think that was an incredible opportunity to see 10x thinking and execution in action, but also learning how to build something. Like, from how do we take these laser boxes and get them certified such that, you know, if a bird sits on it, the bird doesn't get a shock, to how do I ship them into Kenya, then pick it up from the customs office and then mount it on top of a pole. Um, so I learned a lot of like tactics of execution from that. How do you instill the 10x thinking that you mentioned in your head? What do you think are the differences uh, to pursue that? It's a good question. I don't know if I have all the answers, but I think one approach that I take is if I'm looking through two different opportunities, I'll just do a simple risk reward payout, right? If one thing has a 1% chance of succeeding, but can help a billion people versus something else has a 10% chance of succeeding and can help a million people, I'll always choose the former. Now, the problem is I fail a lot more often as well, and I haven't hit gold, but I think with that former approach, um, a lot of good things happen. A few tactical examples. When we're looking at candidates at Udly, which is our current company, we've had folks who are dropping out of college versus someone with 10 years of experience. The guy dropping out of college is so excited, pulls an all-nighter, tells us he's about to change the world with this. Betting on him is a 10x bet for us. Or as an other example, if we want to run an experiment, we've got you know hundreds of thousands of folks using the tool, but I want to figure out who actually cares Conventional wisdom will say, great, gradually roll out paywall and pricing and experiment. Our approach was, let's just put a paywall for everybody and see who churns. And you know, a lot of people did churn and that sucked. But I think thinking this radically gives you clarity on a day-to-day -day basis, but also a lot of face punches, which is why I look like this right now. <laughs> well, uh, it's a roller coaster ride for sure. So uh, you know, it's not, it's not always easy to be on the entrepreneur journey, but seems like you are taking good strides uh, in that regard. Uh, it depends on the day, you know. We're one day away from Thanksgiving. We just closed the contract, so I'm happy. If you spoke to me yesterday, I didn't think the contract was going to close and someone on our team was very sad. So I'd be unhappy. Well, well uh, congratulations uh, on closing that contract. But going back to my previous question when I was asking you what was going on in your head, uh, you know, when you were at uh, a happy place uh, at Google, um, like how did how did you decide that okay, this is what I'm doing, this is what I'm after? Yeah, uh, good question. So the Udly story in a nutshell: one, I've always wanted to start my own thing. Uh, I said, shame on me if I spend my twenties playing the corporate game. That's not the dream I have. Second, I've always wanted to take some risks. You know, we all have our Achilles heels. Mine is immigration. I'm not a U.S. citizen, which means I need to be in the U.S. with a certified employer that can sponsor my visa. Um, can Google's an amazing sponsor, but I was like, I don't want to spend, I don't want to let immigration block me from my dreams. And then third and most importantly, I had this idea I was really passionate about. Um, and I can get into the genesis of Udly at length in maybe the next question, but I was like, this problem needs to be solved. Like if I don't solve it, someone's going to solve it. Like, let me go and spend, you know, the rest, howsoever many years trying to give it a real shot. And then in the 10X approach, my thinking was, well, either I can de-risk it and say, well, if I have a good idea and if I have a team and, you know, if I figure out immigration only, then will I go or I just quit. And then I said, I'll figure it out from there. And I'm still figuring well, it out. Well, let's go straight in. Why do we need Grammarly for speech? Then, uh, idea behind Udly is simple. Too many smart people struggle to speak with confidence, right? I'm talking about the kid in India who deserves the Sergey job way more than me. I'm talking about the immigrant, the introvert, the non-native English speaker who doesn't get a promotion because they don't speak with confidence on stage. Um, talking about the women who get interrupted in corporate America. And we've all been there, right? The night before a speech, an interview, a roundtable discussion as we are talking to a mirror, a camera, a stopwatch, as we're pacing back and forth trying to memorize our slides, there's got to be a better way. And that's the idea behind Udly. Can we do to speaking what Grammarly has done to writing with real-time analytics? 
what Duolingo has done to language learning with bite-sized modules, what Strava or Apple Health have done with fitness, uh, with progress tracking. So Udly is your private, personal, AI-powered speech coach that gives you feedback without the fear of judgment. Does it come uh, as a result from your personal struggles or you feel like you were lucky in that regard, but uh, you still feel like uh, there's a lot of other people and you named them or you named the categories where you know you would like to be helping with the product. But I wanted to ask if uh, there was... Uh, a strong personal struggle that uh, made you to feel extremely passionate about the cause. I mean, totally. I had a list growing up. I was conscious of the way I said three, three, and I'd struggle with that. When I came to the US, I really struggled to fit in. I was at a restaurant and someone asked me, how would you like your beef? And I said, cooked. Obviously, what kind of question is that? And then everyone <laughs> laughed at me. And then when I was at Google, I saw that especially at Google X, some of the most deserving engineers were not getting credit because the louder voices in the room would speak up. Um, so I struggle with this problem. I see people struggle with this problem. In two out of three people in the world are afraid of public speaking. Um, and I think AI is at a point where it can finally help with this. Literally, our alternative is our bathroom mirror. And I spent too much time in front of my bathroom mirror. I've got to at least build a nicer one. So that's why you well, we, got, we kicked off this discussion talking about the current state of AI, but when you actually started Udly, uh, there was not, not such a big hype as there is today, uh, but it seems like you paced it very nicely. It does, looking back, but it's only been a little over a year. The problem is this AI stuff is going so quickly that we, you know a year seems like a million years. No, I think even in the pre-generative AI chat GPT era, you know, technology is at a point where it can evaluate your tone pitch, intonation, body language, content, structure. I don't think anybody has packaged it together in a simple way and given you feedback. Obviously, GPT makes that much easier. But even in a pre-GPT era, this was certainly possible. So how are you tackling the challenge with Udly? Uh how would you describe, uh, you know, the biggest uh, advantages of uh, deploying your product in, in daily life? It's super simple. So you can use Udly in two ways. The first is to come and practice for any presentation. Go to udly.ai, Y-O-O-D-L-I dot A-I. That's my shameless plug. Sign up, practice a speech or an interview. Udly will ask you follow-up questions, give you feedback on your content, structure, delivery, filler words, pacing, etc. That's part one. Part two is use Udly anytime you're speaking. So I'm on this podcast. Udly's nudging me on the side completely in private. It's using machine learning models and only taking my voice and saying, Varun, you're talking too fast. You've been talking for over 90% of this conversation and you just use the non-inclusive word guys. You've got to be careful and you've had four monologues. Like, well, this is a podcast. I'm guessing I need to do more of the speaking. <laughs> it is acceptable, but it's amazing that I have Udly is like my friend, my coach, my spouse that pokes me under the table, right? Like, Varun, shut up. Your joke's not landing. Or Varun, like, stop on slide six. You're making a fool out of yourself. But it does that without anybody knowing so I can course correct real time. How difficult is it to build such a product these days with what's available from OpenAI with GPT, etc. because you mentioned that uh, you rely on them as well. But I assume that there must be a lot of proprietary stuff that you put in to make it all work uh, seamlessly and provide an added value. Yeah, I mean, without a doubt, right? Building a prototype is really easy. That's one of the things I've realized. A prototype is not a product and we learned this the hard way. So the kinds of things that we do in-house, um, Udly is your personalized speech coach. So it learns from your behavior, your goals, um, and helps you be the best speaker you can be. So it's perpetually learning. That's part one. Second is Udly is by your side anytime you're speaking, which means it analyzes only your voice and ignores everyone else's voice. That's really hard to do. And the third piece of it is taking all of these disparate things. So for folks who understand the AI world, we're taking natural language processing, computer vision, speech recognition, and combining it into a single user interface, that is wicked, wicked hard to do. And I would not say we've solved it. 
we are experimenting with it every day. And like, where do you see the biggest obstacles right now for Udly to expand to many, many more, more users? To be honest, it's behavior change. People hate practicing. People hate watching themselves back on camera, right? You'll say, oh my God, I sound like this. I have a pimple. I haven't shaved. Oh my, like everything is bad. <laughs> what that means is we are creating a new category. Nobody is going out today and searching for an AI speech coach. We need to get people to be aware of the problem normalize this behavior and then get them to enjoy it. So our biggest challenge is category creation and behavior change. I feel like the behavior change is something that does not happen overnight. And sometimes it even takes generations. I am like really, really looking forward because like we have uh, uh, mobile phones pretty much glued to our hands these days. Uh, and we are now seeing the rise of all the AI tools, but uh, I don't think that it's supernatural for us to be using them on a daily basis, right? There there are people that, uh, you know, went straight in and started using uh, ChatGPT or GitHub Copilot on a daily basis for everything and anything. But I feel like it takes a lot of time to get the masses to actually think of those tools uh, every time there is an opportunity to deploy them. And I feel like for Udly, uh, it's the same, right? You named a lot of examples how it can be beneficial, but um, it takes some time for people to learn that. And do you see any, um, I would say, education that you could do in terms of addressing the younger generation. So as they grow, they use it for more and more stuff. Or do you look at it as like, okay, this is a professional product. We are going after uh, the the older audience. Totally. Let me get into that in a second. But I've been doing so much of the talking. I'm curious to hear your thoughts, right? You use Udly for the first time on your own. What was your experience like? And you can be totally blunt. You know, where were you like, oh, I don't need this or this is interesting. I haven't thought of it. And maybe that will help suss out my answer on how do we get people more aware of it. I think for me was uh, the seamlessness of user experience. I think that was that was a little bit of a blocker because every time I use like different device or different pair of headphones, different setup for uh, for a meeting and like making this work seamlessly has not been the smoothest for me. So that's why it would not be like a go-to. But imagine that uh, like uh, Udly is fully integrated as part of the operating system, right? And it's like working every time, all the time. Not that, you know, the like uh, speakers and microphones even would work every time, all the time. I think that everyone like, experience is that, oh, like I have to switch sound or I am on mute. Oh, the camera is not working. Like, I, I think that like with these uh, peripheral devices, uh, we still struggle with that. And I think that is disrupting the flow. But I think other than that, right, it will be great if it's seamlessly integrated into everything. And then I can pick, oh, now I'd like uh, to get feedback or I would like to analyze. We had We had this great podcast and I would love to know uh, the takeaways and how I can improve for next time. Where was I uh, tapping for like asking the right question or I mispronounced something or something like that, right? Th th this is amazing. I feel like there is uh, a whole lot of power. And I, I think it's very similar to when um, we looked at ChatGPT for the first time and we saw, oh, wow, that's massive, right? That's going to be a game changer in terms of what it can provide. You said it really well. We need to improve some of the user experience. I think that's ongoing startup stuff. What you want is the Lubo Udly Copilot that is on your computer at all times. And whenever you need it, it's giving you feedback. Yeah. And like, not just my computer. I want this to be fully embedded in the whole suite of products that I use, right? Oh, I see. So what you want is, you know, I don't know if you're married or not, but you're on a date and Udly is just telling you, listen, ask her questions. Like, don't talk about yourself, as an example. I mean, like, that's a bit of an overkill, okay, but uh, why, why, why not? Why not okay. trying that? Okay. 
All but right. If and and I think that like with like what Humane is building right now, with uh, you know, Vision Pro and some smaller form factor devices, and you combine it with Neuralink, connect all of that together, and it's it's insane what uh, will be happening in the future. I think that we will really be strongly augmented with uh, a lot of technology to be able to operate in uh, in a lot different way. And maybe I'm being too futuristic, but like everything is heading that direction. I mean, look, it's exciting and scary at the same time. It sounds like a real life Black Mirror episode, right? Like Neuralink understands my thoughts and then Udly, ChatGPT helps me structure them and then Udly helps me say them in the best way possible. <laughs> Boom. Right, and, and like it, it, it is a real life Black Mirror episode, but I think like all is headed that direction, and the progress that we have seen over just the past twelve months is insane. I think one thing I do want to flag is we joke about the Black Mirror episode, but this is something that keeps me up at night. Right, we're dealing with speech, which is a deep rooted human insecurity. And I want to be very clear that you know, success for me is not having kids in India talk like Steve Jobs. If we do that, we would have really messed up. How do we build technology with the humility and creativity to say, your human communication always comes first. Udly will help you be the best speaker you want to be, but it's not going to force you to talk like a robot. And I'm sure there's a big market to get everyone to talk the same way, but that is absolutely not our goal. And if we do that, we would have failed miserably. Um, and that's one of, when you use a platform, you will see a lot of customizations on what do you care about? Okay, Varun, you talked really quickly. Here's some data on how you went really fast, but that's fine. The audience still understood your message. I think of Udly as like my medical report or you know my Strava when I'm on a bike ride. There's not necessarily a right answer to speaking. It's just a self-evaluative tool to see how I'm doing. How do you look at privacy um, and uh, when it comes to the product that you are building? Because in the end, there might be a lot of uh, very, very sensitive stuff. Yeah, it's a good question. And to be honest, so as context for everyone, where Udly is today is Toastmasters International has rolled this out to 300,000 members. Many Fortune 500 companies are using us and hundreds and hundreds of executives are using Udly before. You know, a media appearance or an all-hands appearance or a difficult salary conversation, etc. What that means is privacy has to be front and center and completely buttoned up from a business standpoint, but also from an ethical standpoint, right? This is someone's biggest insecurity. We've got to handle it with care. The nuts and bolts of it are you can opt to have all of your data removed from any machine learning model. All of your speeches, videos, et cetera, instantly deleted, but only the analytics will stay. Um, you can choose who accesses your speech, very much like Google Drive. So we've modeled our sharing based on them. We are trying our best to meet, obviously, the legal bar, but also have a much larger ethical bar and ensuring like everyone's aware of how we think about privacy. You have uh, had an opportunity to analyze the spe one of the speeches of Elon Musk What's been the learning from analyzing how he delivers the speech? Yeah. To put it bluntly, if he weren't as brilliant as he were, I don't know how far he would make it. He could be a much better speaker. Or there are many other people as who are not as smart as Elon Musk, who speak slightly better, who, who can make it. The crux of it is, you know, Elon's funny, compelling, controversial, whatever, but there is a lot of repetition, redundancy, um, beating around the bush. And the AI speech coach tells him that point blank. Elon, you gave a 12-minute commencement speech. Here's how you could have said that in three minutes with the same kind of impact. In fact, I think like Forbes or Fortune wrote an article about it. They took Elon's speech, ran it through Udly. And now a lot of media outlets do that, right? When Joe Biden has a State of the Union or some Hollywood celebrity wins an Oscar, they just analyze the speech through Udly. So how do you actually get to a point that uh, you build something so valuable that it can provide you these uh, great pieces of feedback 
right? What what are all the things that you need to plug in together? Uh, because it, as you mentioned, just to build a simple proof of concept uh, was was easy, but uh, where were the hard uh, challenges that uh, you had to really figure out to make this uh, a very unique product? Yep. So I'll give you a few really tactical examples. The first is all of the technical integrations with limited latency, right? To the point of seamless user experience you talked about. I've come, I've practiced a speech. I'm expecting instant results. So my computer vision pipeline needs to work with my transcript, needs to work with my video immediately with a really pretty interface. Figuring that out was hard. The second is having the subject matter expertise. Right, what might be good speaking in India might be very different speaking in Japan, maybe different from what, I don't know, a Google exec expects. As a result of which, we've been working with tens of thousands of speech coaches around the world. Think of this as like a debate instructor, a freelance coach, somebody who trains you know, employees at Meta on how to speak better. And they've helped us build the system that provides the best possible feedback, but the coach can, can still customize it. And I say that because Udly is not competing against human coaches. A really good analogy is if the human coach is the accountant, Udly is TurboTax, right? We'll help them scale their business and go much faster. The partnership with speech coaches gives us a lot of ability to scale. That's number two. Um, number three is figuring out like, how do we think through language integrations and deeper level feedback? Right now, a lot of the feedback we give you is, here are the key points your audience took away. Here's where you could have been better. But the real essence of speaking is, Varun, here's where you just sounded like a douchebag and the listener lost attention. And giving that kind of feedback is really, really hard. Um, but I think, you know, if there are three levels of feedback, level one is like filler words, pace, et cetera. Level two is content. Level three is the true emotion. And going from level two to level three is very, very hard. So we're trying to figure yeah. out that technical challenge. And you have mentioned an insane number of speech coaches that uh, you have had help, uh, basically, you build a great product. How do you gather the feedback from them and how do you organize such a large crowd of people? Yeah, it's a good question. It's our earliest adopters were speech coaches. So we positioned ourselves as a speech coach's assistant just so that we would grow as they would. Um, anytime a coach interacts with Udly, Udly understands, you know, their preferences and then gives them a tailored experience accordingly. So the AI coach might say something and then if the human coach says, no, ignore this, Udly will then learn and the system will get better. Got it. And so there is a way to also provide feedback or it was just for the speech coaches that they were able to do that? Or like a general user can say, I respect that piece of feedback, but I actually would like my speech to be... Uh, like that. Yep. So yes to all. So a user can engage with the AI and say, yes, I like this. No, I don't. Uh, but the second piece of it is, look, you come to Udly, you practice with AI, you get AI powered feedback. But again, as I said, the human connection is really important. At the click of a button, you can share that Udly with all of your analytics, with a friend, a coach, a colleague, and then they can leave you timestamped feedback. So it makes the process of collaborating much easier. As an example, you know, if I have a presentation tomorrow, typically I'd get five people in a room to record me and then they'd all give me feedback and we'd all lose one hour. Now we can do this asynchronously. So a lot of career services centers, for instance, at universities are using Udly, right? If I'm the head of career services at Harvard Business School, typically I would have hundreds of students come in and we'd keep practicing. Why do you want a job at McKinsey? Tell me about yourself. We'll do the same thing over and over again. Now students can practice with AI, send me their mock interview and I can asynchronously critique them and save a lot more time. What have been some of the success stories, how uh, people used uh, Udly that uh, got stuck in your head? Yeah, um, I mean, there are lots of things about startup life that suck. The most exciting thing is every day now when I wake up, I have lots of emails from folks saying, listen, thank you. I landed my dream job or this changed my life. I'll give you two stories that really spoke to me. The first was there was a guy in India who had been using our system like 50 times a day. And he was just triggering all of our dashboard alarms. So I was like, I've got to speak to this guy. What is he doing? Is he, you know, streaming Lord of the Rings on Udly and like violating our fair use policies? 
So I got on a call with him and he said he had a stroke in his early 20s and has been working to get his speech back. And every day he's been coming to Udli and, you know, practicing how to speak. And he's like, if Udli understands how I'm doing, another human will. And this is all in private. And I was like, that just makes it so worth it. Um, or another story was, again, in India, I mean, as you know, I'm most passionate about building this for folks in India. There's a guy in rural India who was using the tool. Again, every day. So I was like, I got to get on a call. Who is this guy? And he was practicing his English learning skills on Udly. So every day, because, you know, Udly simulates a conversation with you. Uh, he would use Udly to improve his English. And then he got his entire village to start using Udly with him. You know, even with poor internet and they were using it on a mobile phone and the tool wasn't perfect at this point. And now they are some of our biggest users. Well, do you see that as an opportunity to expand more into also like language learning or you you would like to stick with like the, the niche that, that you have for now? I, I think we definitely have an element of language learning, but Udly at its core is a speech coaching tool. However, a lot of our users tend to be, you know, as I was saying, Eastern European, Indian, South American, non-native English speakers, where we know how to speak English, but we might think in our native language first and then translate it and respond. Uh, so our oh, yeah. challenge isn't learning English. It's saying the right thing at the right time and being funny or charming or whatever. And previously you mentioned that, uh, you know, things are not always... Uh nice and easy uh, when you are living a startup life and building uh, your own product. What's been uh, the toughest moment for you so far that uh, you had to go through? So we don't just talk about the nice stuff. I mean, you've got to ask me this on a day-to-day -day basis. A number of times I go home in the evening just in tears saying, what am I doing? I had this good thing at Google. Um, you know, every day we take two steps forward, like several steps backwards. I'll give you examples. One, we were completely invested in Silicon Valley Bank. When that collapse happened, we almost missed pay payroll. Second, fundraising. I mean, it's an exhausting, cruel process where you keep taking no's over and over again in the same day, and then you have to smile and go through a pitch yet again. We've had our site completely conk off and us not knowing why, and then us spending the entire night trying to fix it. Um, every day is a new challenge. You know, an, a dream employee who I've been trying to chase for three months has signed and is starting tomorrow. And the day before signing, they renege because their previous company suddenly gave them a new offer. When I was at Google, these things didn't sting as much because everything was so easy. But Every day comes with some kind of really big face punch. Um, and I think the important part is celebrating the mini wins, no matter how small. Otherwise, like you are going to go nuts. And I think I'm borderline nuts right now. <laughs> you, you have to be ready to take all of these face punches. Otherwise, you are not uh, fit uh, for being on the journey. I think also you've got to, again, what do I know? I've been doing this for 30 seconds and I'm definitely beating up. <laughs> But you've also got to understand that this is just such a long game, you know. When, so we raised a pretty sizable seed round. We raised $7 million. And I remember when I raised all of that money, I just cried because I was like, oh, my God, I've done all of this to get to the starting line. Like, the game starts now. And then, you know, we built this product. We got really large user base. And then we introduced a paywall. And I was like, oh, my God, the game starts That's the now. starting line. And it's just the starting line keeps moving over and over and over again. And it's how do you not tie your complete identity and self-worth to it? I don't have a good answer. I'm struggling with it, to be honest. But I have friends and a co-founder who's super supportive and we're figuring it out. And it seems like it has not been the smoothest uh, even to raise uh, the money for you. How many uh, pitches did you have to go through? That sucks. I mean, God, 50, 60, I don't even remember at this point. But he, here's what's really hard about fundraising. One, oftentimes you're speaking to the biggest big shot investor. So someone who's like the first investor in Uber or Airbnb will be like, no, you're an idiot. Like that really stings. I'm like, oh, wow, if this genius told me I'm an idiot, I must really suck. Or alternatively, 
you don't get a meeting with the biggest big shot. You get a meeting with the most junior employee. So I'm talking to some venture fund where there's like a 21 year old who's grilling me on questions that they definitely have no answer to themselves. I'm like, what am I doing? I need to schmooze with this 21 year old in order to convince them to even give me the next meeting. And then they reject me for no reason. And I'm like, well, that really sucks. Or I have a great meeting. I come out of it. I'm like, awesome. And then you just get ghosted. What's really hard about fundraising is, you know, in every other time in your life, you take rejections, but you don't have to like immediately bounce back. So with college applications, I send out all of my college applications and then I get all of the results of rejection, rejection, acceptance. Okay, I'm going to college. Or, you know, if I ask someone out on a date, it's like they say no, then I'm sad for a few weeks. Then I go ask someone else out on a date. Or with job applications, right? Like I'll apply to Google, they'll say no. Then two weeks later, I'll do the Amazon interview. Fundraising is very different because in the morning, I'll go and pitch to someone and they'll say no or they'll ghost me. And then 15 minutes later, I'm going and doing the exact same pitch to somebody else. And then I'm doing the same thing to someone else. So you're just getting rolling rejections, but continuing to say the same story. And that is just exhausting. Well, how do you equip yourself to be able to survive that uh, amount of pressure? I don't know. I'm definitely not great at it and I'm struggling. Well, you managed to get through it. So there must be something behind it. I, I don't know. I think things that are helping me... Uh, you know, during our fundraise, for instance, a lot of people said, well, this is a really big business and you should sell it to sales teams and then sales leaders can sell with more confidence. And I was like, oh, maybe. And then I started pitching that way. And then my co-founder, Isha, sat me down and she's like, Varun, that's not the company you want to build. Like, you know, hopefully we'll make a lot more money, but our dream is to help introverts, kids in India, non-native English speakers speak with confidence. Like, why don't you just stay true to that? This is a roundabout way of saying the thing that keeps me going is, and I, at least I believe I'm genuinely doing this to help people I care about. And that's what gets me most excited. So every time, you know, we have a few face punches, talking to that user in India who had a stroke or the person in that village really gets me going. Um, I think it's just that, like, I don't know how people work on construction software, backend service. It's a massive industry, it's needed. But like, I just won't be able to wake up in the morning despite the 50th face punch. I think uh, you have to always find uh, the purpose for what you are doing, right? Because in the end, that uh, is something that fulfills you. Uh, hopefully, no matter what's happening uh, on the outside. Are there... TBD, my friend. TBD. <laughs> are there any other things that are part of your routine? How you keep uh, your mind and body in check? I'm starting to get a lot more disciplined with this stuff. In the past, I used to be very bad. Like if I had a bad day and it's 8 p.m., I'm like, oh, I did no work today. And then from 8 to 4 a.m., I would work. And then my next day would also go. So now I have systems in place where I need to ride my bike every day, no matter what, even if that's for 10 minutes. Uh, I have water drinking goals. I have called my mom goals. I have all of these little processes and checklists that I have to solve five chess puzzles a day. It's just part of my rule. I could do it on the toilet. I could do it before I sleep. And having this mini checklist on a day-to-day -day basis gives me goals outside of work, and that really helps. What do you uh, use to uh, keep uh, track of the checklist? Friends, to be honest. Like, I don't have a fancy Notion doc or anything. Um, I have friends who hold me accountable through perspective. The other thing that helps is I've started journaling a lot, and every day I talk about, like, one thing I'm grateful for or one good thing that happened. Um, and that really helps because when I'm feeling low, I look back and I'm like, oh, wow, only last week I had this amazing thing happen to me. And again, I think everyone has their own coping mechanisms. I'm experimenting with mine. Yeah, there, there's a there's thousand things that you can uh, make part of your daily routine, right? And uh, wait, wait, I enough think you... me, what, what do you do? Like you're a successful founder and entrepreneur. Like you've seen the story way more than I have. It's <laughs> nice. <laughs> Not sure about that, but for me, and uh, I tend to experiment and I, I really uh, tend to change the routine every now and then. But what's been the cornerstone of uh, keeping me in check recently is that every day, 11 a.m., I do my workout. And uh, why 11 a.m.? That's like middle of the day. 
it's middle of the day, but I feel like, you know, I wake up, I do a little bit of work and then I get the, I get the, like, I get the energy from working out to be able to go through, uh, the rest of the day. And, uh, I figured that, uh, 11 AM is, uh, the best time for me. Uh, sometimes I do, uh, a yoga session very early in the morning. But uh, that's the one thing. If there is only one thing that I want to accomplish that day and I want to work throughout the, the, the rest of time, that will be it. And, um, but but I, I tend to change uh, that every, every now and then and experiment with something new. But for me, working out has been uh, one of uh, the most important elements of uh, keeping me uh, in line and... Uh, yeah, other, other than that, uh, there's a lot of sauna and ice bath as well uh, as, as being part of it. But uh, yeah, I think that these are these are like the, the core pieces of uh, what, what I do to And do you listen track. to like a particular audiobook or podcast? I, I listen to many. Uh, there is, of course, like uh, I listen to Lex Friedman, Joe Rogan. Um, uh, and like, it really depends on the guest, uh, uh, every now and then there is a, there is a good book, uh, that, that I listened to most recently. It's, uh, be useful from Arnold, uh, big fan of his, uh, and like, uh, I'm not sure if you know, but we had a chance to collaborate together. So, and it was pretty exciting. Oh, really? That's uh, cool. oh yeah. Oh yeah. That was, that was a lot of fun. I will. I have many so, more questions, but obviously, you want to be mindful of podcast time. I'll bug you about that offline. <laughs> well, then, then, then we have to switch things up for for next time, and you can pretty much interview me. There we go. Yeah, I have all these questions. Eleven a.m. workout. He's currently wearing a shirt that says "Wrong Gym," so he's very serious about this. <laughs> no, that's right. That's that's definitely part of part of my big part of my life. That's uh, yeah, huge one. Well, Varun, if there would be two or three things that you would like the listeners or people watching uh, the podcast to take away, what would it be? It's a good question. I'll give you the cheesy one and then the actual one. I think one of the things I'm trying to do at Udly is, look, I don't know if Udly will be successful or not. I, I'm just trying to have a good time through it. And I'm in my head far too often. No matter what you're doing, like try to have a good time. But most importantly, go to Udly and sign up. That's the important thing, <laughs> not messing with you. But it's at yudli.ai, Y-O-O-D-L-I dot A-I. Um, give it a spin. You'll get feedback on your speaking. If it sucks, let me know why. If it's awesome, you know, tweet about us and let others know why. You can also let others know if it sucks. But yeah, the biggest thing for me through startup life is it's got to be fun. If it's not fun, you're definitely messing up. Well, uh, you want to have fun on your startup journey. I definitely had a lot of fun uh, talking to you and uh, having you on the podcast. I would uh, hugely recommend uh, everyone listening or watching to check out Udly and get the feedback on their speaking skills. But wanted to thank you for hopping on the show and I had a blast. Thank you. Turns out I spoke, my, my pacing went down towards the end of this podcast. I gave you more opportunities to speak, but I still had too many monologues and I spoke for about, you know, 80%, so I could do better. I think it was just fun, but uh, great to hear the summary of our discussion. Awesome, Lubo, thank you so much. And it's such an honor to be here. Likewise, thank you. Thank you so much for listening or watching to the very end. I hope it can only mean one thing, that you enjoyed it. And if you did, please go ahead, follow, subscribe, or write a review. And it will be tremendously appreciated by our side and help us to bring great next guests. In the meantime, there are a lot of other episodes that you can check out. And I'll be looking forward to catching you next time.